Hello, and welcome to part one of an infrequent series about augmenting reality. In this series, I'm going to be learning about and exploring the algorithms that operate behind the scenes and enable augmented reality applications. And I think a good place to start will be with one of the more enjoyable algorithms, Optic Flow. Before we get stuck into the algorithm, I thought it might be worth having a look at the setup, and what I've got here is my webcam at a low resolution displaying a grayscale image at the command prompt, and I've done a whole video about that already. I'm not going to go into the details of the webcam application just here. And we can see I've currently got a friend, I've got a red rectangle stuck to my head. And the idea of optic flow is I can create a velocity map that allows me to interact with things on the scenery. So you can see I can manipulate the rectangle with my hands. Uh, I'm doing it rather gingerly and slowly because if I hit the rectangle it gets more velocity. So there's some sort of physics involved with how the rectangle behaves. And if the rectangle goes off the screen, I've made it wrap around to the bottom. And we can see now, rather unfortunately, it's got stuck in my microphone. So if I move my hands around, you can see the microphone's in the way. Uh, so I need to just go in front of the microphone and lift up the object, or at least flick it out of the way. Come on, there we go. Get out of the way. So this is a crude form of augmented reality. But the algorithm behind it is quite nice, and it also covers some of the fundamentals of image processing. And what I'm trying to demonstrate is that, for the most part, the object behaves according to how I'm interacting with it. I can push it one way or the other. Let's try and find him again. One last time. There we go. So I'll bring the, the rectangle to the middle of the screen and just try and leave it there. You see, I can push it to the left, and I can push it back to the right a little bit. I'll try and grab hold of it from above and bring it back down. Where, we, where am I going? There we go. Perfect. Right, that's enough waving my arms around, let's have a look how it works. Let's start by considering how motion is determined between two successive images. So here I've got the two pictures on the left, which are frames taken from a camera. And uh, t minus 0 here is the most recent frame, and t minus 1 is the frame before that, so the previous frame. And we can see that the little chappy inside the uh, frame has waved his arm, it's moved a little bit. And if we subtract the two images, what we actually get is uh, not the whole body, but we just get the two locations that have changed. So we'll get the original arm plus the new arm. And depending on how the image is encoded and the type of the movement and the luminance on the screen, one of these will be positive and one of them will be negative. And if we take the absolute values of all of the pixel values, i.e. set them all to positive, we can work out an area where motion has occurred. But all this map will tell us is that motion has happened. And whereabouts in the map has the motion happened? We don't know what direction, and we don't know how much. Because in the world of image processing, our motion is represented as just being the difference between two successive frames in time. Before we start working out the motion vector for individual pixels, let's consider how we would do it for the whole image. So I want to imagine a scenario where the camera is moving, but the scene that the camera is viewing remains mostly static. In this case, I've got two successive frames, shown by the black and the blue image, and our brains can work out that actually, the, even though they're similar, one of the frames has moved slightly. In fact, the camera must have moved in this direction, because we can see that the little man has moved towards the left of the frame. If we overlay the frames precisely, we can see this more clearly. And the result we're interested in is how much movement has occurred. And there's really only one way to test this. Now because this is the first video in this series, I'm trying to keep things conceptually simple enough, so I'm not going to be looking into the more advanced routines and feature extraction routines which would typically be used to solve this problem. Instead, we're going to brute force it. And so to calculate the motion vector, the only thing we can do is to physically test the new frame in a variety of different positions to see where does it line up with the old frame. And so we would just need to algorithmically overlay the two and see where they have the closest match, i.e. where is the difference between them the minimum. And of course, it's like this. And once we've found the closest match, we can observe the nature of the vector that we need to represent that motion. And don't forget, this is for the whole image moving. This is as if the camera is moving. And because it's the whole image, we can assume that the vector has its origin at the middle of that image. And we only have the one vector for the whole image, and this is our global optic flow. And your computer mouse operates on a similar principle to this. It rapidly takes images in succession and tries to work out how the image has transformed in the 2D plane from one location to another. 
Once it's done this, that vector is then translated into coordinates that are sent to the computer to move the mouse cursor around. Now the type of optic flow we're interested in isn't global optic flow as such, it's local optic flow. We want to work it out per pixel. So every pixel in our image gets associated with a vector that suggests how that pixel might have moved in the past. And so things that remain static don't really have a vector at all, so the body here didn't change. In fact, the only thing that did change was the arm. Here again, I've got our two successive frames. And if I overlay them, we can see the difference is really just the arm changing position. For a given pixel, I'm going to try and work out where has that pixel come from. And to do this, I create a patch that surrounds that pixel. And this patch will be a small fragment of the image. It will have some statistical features that make it different to other parts of the image. I'm going to assume that's the case for now. Of course it might not be, and that could lead to errors in this algorithm. Once I've got a small patch, I'm then going to test that patch against lots of different locations. Within a given search area. And we need to restrict the search area for two reasons. One is if we search the whole image, it would be tremendously slow. It's not a very computationally efficient algorithm. But secondly, we can assume that the differences between frames on the whole are minimal, particularly if it's a human being. I can't move my arm so fast that it makes a massive difference at, say, 30 frames per second. For each patch in the search area, I record the similarity with the base patch. And in this instance, it would be somewhere like here. They're not exactly the same, but they represent a similar part, a similar feature of the arm. And therefore, for this patch to get from the location in green to the location in red, it had to move with this vector. Once we've found the best matching patch for every pixel in the image, we can then modulate our vector field map with the original motion image. Because a lot of the vectors we're not interested in. There hasn't been any motion, and so they'll just be the results of noise and other unwanted estimations and byproducts of the searching algorithm. So we restrict then to just the pixels that we're interested in, and all of the other vectors effectively get set to zero. Now let's start with the coding. But I want to emphasize that I'm not making any effort at all to try and optimize this algorithm. In fact, it's going to be very inefficient and run quite poorly indeed. And the reason for this is I want to keep it clear. I want to keep the step-by-step -step nature of the algorithm uh, very visible for viewers to study how does the algorithm work. But I do intend to follow up this video with another video that specifically talks about optimizing this algorithm using a technique called integral images. But for this video, we're going to keep it simple and brute force, and we're going to pay the price for that simplicity. As usual, I'm using the OLC console game engine, and if you've seen the webcam video, we're going to use a library called SCAPI to handle the webcam for us. And I've derived a class from the console game engine called AR Optic Flow. Because the performance is going to suffer in this algorithm, I'm using quite a low resolution console, 80 by 60 characters where each character is 16 by 16 pixels. And I've taken the liberty of already entering the webcam capture code. We don't need to see it again. And this involved a union and some variables to handle and represent the camera, some code to initialize the camera to a given size, and in this case that's going to be the size of our console, using the screen width and screen height functions. And in the onUserUpdate function, I've created a lambda function to simply draw an image to the screen. And in this case, an image is going to be a two-dimensional floating point array. It just iterates through the array and chooses the appropriate combination of characters and colors that represent that pixel. The first thing the onUserUpdate function is going to do is capture the image and convert it into normalized grayscale values, which we'll use for the rest of the algorithm. And the frame returned by the camera after processing for luminance is going to be stored in a 2D array called FNewCamera. So let's add that now. And for the arrays, I'm just creating a pointer to a floating point variable. And in the onUserCreate function, I'm going to allocate the memory, depending on the size of the console, and I'm going to initialize it to zero. Just to make sure everything so far is in order, I'm going to call the lambda function draw image and pass to it the 2D array that represents our new camera, and we should just be able to see the raw image on the screen. Let's take a look. And there we go. It's a bit low resolution, it's a bit fuzzy. Just to prove that this really does work, I'm going to quadruple the resolution into something which is a bit more standard webcam. And now, hello, you can see me quite clearly. Let's start by just calculating motion within the camera scene. I need to record the previous frame, so I'm going to create another array called old camera. And our motion is going to be the difference between these two arrays. I'm not going to show this each time, but for each array we're going to allocate it and set it all to zero. We can see here that for each on-user update, we completely overwrite the FNew camera array. 
with the new luminance values. So before we overwrite the new one, we should store it, and we'll store it into the old one. Now this array operates on a pixel by pixel basis. It's going through every single pixel in the image, giving us a, an x and a y coordinate. So this allows me to create a new variable called fdiff, which represents the absolute difference between two corresponding pixels for the two arrays. So the pixels are in the same place, but the arrays are different. And I'm going to create a lambda function called getPixel to do the sampling into these arrays. I'll put this lambda function with my other one. And the reason for doing this is I can check that the coordinates of the array are in bounds, and I can also specify it to return a zero, which we'll find to be quite useful later on if it's not within the bounds. Once I've calculated the difference per pixel, I'm going to fill a third array motion image with those differences, but I'm going to ignore all the differences that are so small that they don't contain any useful information. One of the things about working with webcams and image processing is you're working with real-world data, and it's rubbish. The real world will throw absolutely everything at you that it can to interfere with your progress. So you'll find in a lot of image processing algorithms we do have to threshold and tweak values to make things work. And so to account for some of the just simple pixel noise that's going to occur between frames, because it's never going to be the same value of pixel twice, really, I'm going to set it to zero if it's below that amount. I'm curious to see our motion image, and because of the draw image lambda function, we can easily do that at any time. Let's take a look. So in a still scene, there's not much at all. But if I move, we can see we've got the difference between two successive frames. And it's quite sensitive, so I'm just ever so slightly moving my microphone around and we can see we're getting basically an edge detect. But we're not interested in edges for this video. But even though I'm trying to be as still as I possibly can, we can see there are lots of spurious elements firing each time. And that's just through little vibrations of the camera mount, camera noise that's being picked up and not being filtered out, and also an estimation of how much motion really qualifies as motion. So I'm trying to keep my head as still as possible, but just because I'm talking means it's moving around a little bit. And I don't really think that this should interact with the world. So I want to now remove small movements. And by small movements, I mean rapid and large changes between frames. These are not likely to be natural. To remove the temporal high frequency components of the image, I'm going to add a low pass filter. The low pass filtered image is going to be yet another 2D array. I've created that further up in the code. Into this image, I accumulate a small amount of the difference between the filtered image and the new image. So here we can see I've got the new image, I'm subtracting the filtered image, and I'm taking 10% of it and accumulating it into the filtered image. And of course, with my draw image lambda function, I can see what that looks like too. Let's take a look. So we can see the image sort of faded into existence, and it's become very stable. In fact, I'm talking, and you can't see my mouth move. And if I do move, I ghost. If I move my arm up and keep it still, it takes some time for the arm to appear. And so we've effectively removed all of the little high frequency jitters, and it's quite ghostly. And if I move very rapidly, waving my arms around, you see it never really settles, so it's ignoring this high frequency motion. And of course this 10% is quite tunable, so if I set it to say 80% instead, what we're allowing is actually far faster motion. So you see there's still a little bit of ghosting, but not very much at all. My mouth still doesn't look like it's moving as much as it normally should. If I open it, you see it takes some time. So my mouth is moving at such a speed that that's being filtered out by the algorithm. But because we're taking a larger chunk now, we're allowing more high speed components through, we can see that the boundary of the light here in the background is quite flickery and jittery. And of course, this will look like motion to our algorithm because it is a change of pixel values between successive frames. Now that we've got our filtered image, we need to update our motion calculation to use the filtered images, because currently they're using the new camera and old camera, which are not filtered at all. So I'm going to change this line to use filtered variants instead. As you can see, I'm going to need to create an old filtered camera variable to accommodate this, and I'm going to update the old filtered camera array in the same place that I'm updating the simple old camera array. This means now that my motion image is really robust and only contains significant motion. 
Since we've acquired the image, the next phase is to calculate the optic flow vector map. I'm going to shove the draw image into its own section now, which is update screen. As already discussed for this video, we're just going to do things in a brute force way. We're not thinking about efficiency just yet. And so I'm creating two variables, both integers. Uh, one is patch size, which is going to be the square dimension of the patch that we're looking for. So in this case, uh, a feature could be a 9x9 nine nine collection of pixels. And I'm going to specify the search size, which is a 7x7 seven seven grid of pixels through which to search with the patch. Let's just have a quick look at some numbers to see why this approach isn't particularly efficient. Well, for a 320 by 240 array of pixels, that's 76,800 pixels, we're going to be performing a search over a 7x7 seven seven grid. So that's 49 possible locations for each pixel to exist in which means we've got 3,763,200 search locations to do. And for each search location, we've got a patch of image to test. Our patch is going to be 9 by 9 pixels. So for each of our 3.7 million searches, we've got 81 comparisons to make, which means we've got 304,819,000 200 comparisons between pixels to perform. And let's assume we want to run that at 30 frames per second. Well, that's an easy total of 9,144,576,000 individual pixel comparisons to make to run at a real-time rate. And when you factor in the operating system and the fact that it's all random access to memory and the pollution of your cache and lots of other problems, we can see that this algorithm isn't particularly efficient at all. And so to help us out, I'm going to significantly reduce the resolution of the algorithm uh, to get it to run at least in double digits frame rate on my fairly high-end machine. But don't forget, there's going to be a follow-up video which talks about solving this problem. So let's now go back to our original resolution. It does mean we can make the pixels bigger. We're going to have quite a few nested for loops here, so it's going to be a little tricky for me to keep everything on the screen without zooming out. We know, to begin with, we're going to go through every single pixel. So let's start there. Let's create two for loops that iterate across the screen and down the screen. I'm going to initialize the variables for this pixel. And for each pixel, we're going to store a variable called patch difference max, which is set to a very large number, which is going to keep track of which one of our search patches is the closest fit to our base patch. I'm also going to initialize to zero two more two-dimensional vectors, flow x and flow y, which are the x and y components of our overall motion for that pixel. Now I need the next stage of my for loops. For each pixel, we need to go over a search area. In this case, the search area is just going to be a rectangle surrounding the original pixel. So I'm going to create a vector that represents the vector from the original pixel to the uh, center of the search area. I'm going to create another variable, f accumulated difference, which is going to be the total difference for a single patch at this search location. And it will be this accumulated difference which is compared to the max difference later on to see which patch is the closest fit to the base patch. Now we need the next set of for loops for the patch. Since the search vector represents the middle of the patch that's being searched, I can create the actual pixel coordinates as an offset of that search vector, assuming that the search vector is in the middle of the patch. So it's very similar to what we had before. And in a similar way, I can work out the indices required for the base patch, which is basically just the patch size around the pixel that we're testing. Now that I've worked out the indices for the pixels in both the search patch location and the base patch location, I can extract the luminance values of the two successive frames at those locations, and then update my accumulated difference. Make sure to use the absolute function to accumulate the difference because there will be some negative values in this and they will subtract from the difference. So for each pixel and for each search location and for each individual patch pixel we accumulate a difference and this means we can compare patches and it's important to compare patches because I want the patch which is the closest match to the base patch. And so if my accumulated difference is lower than the current max accumulated difference, i.e there is the least difference, then I want to store in my 2D flow fields the search vector that we created earlier. 
And as you can see, we frequently use this sort of notation, which always implies per pixel, y times screen width plus x. We've now finished the brute force algorithm, and every pixel in the flow field has been allocated a vector of motion. It's time to modulate this flow field with the motion image. And so if the motion image contains motion, which remember has been quite severely filtered earlier on, then we know that this motion must be significant. Else if there is no motion, then we set the flow field vectors to zero, to indicate as such. Now the reason we need to do this modulation is that the patch search routine has to come up with a value. It has to choose a vector even if there has been no motion. Hopefully that value indicates zero, zero, but it might not and we want to remove these spurious motion vectors from contaminating our vector flow field. Now we effectively have a 2D map of velocity per pixel. We can have some fun with this by using those vectors as part of a physics calculation to control an object, i.e. the red square you saw me manipulating at the start of the video. So I've created two sets of vectors, obviously they're pairs because it's an x and y component, one which represents the position and one which represents the velocity. And in on user create, I'm going to initialize the ball's position to be in the middle of the frame. Now a number of my videos this year have centered on doing some rudimentary physics for games and this one is no different. In fact you can look at the Flappy Bird video, yes that one, uh, to have a look at what we're about to discuss. But very simply we're going to update the ball's velocity based on its position within the velocity field. And so here you can see the individual components being updated. We use the ball's location in the optic flow field to find the component of the vector with which to augment the velocity. So in this case in our x component field uh, I use the ball's current position to find uh, the correct index into that field which will give me the x component of the optic flow vector and I multiply that by a constant that represents some sort of speed. This will need to be tuned depending on your application and I also include f elapsed time just to keep things running smoothly uh, as the algorithm can be quite fluctuating. And I do the same for the y component. The ball's position is simply augmented by the uh, velocity with respect to f elapsed time. I've included the value 1 here just as in case we needed a tuning parameter. To give the ball some weight uh, I've added a drag effect to it and I'm just simply reducing the velocity by a fixed amount over time. This means the ball's velocity will tend towards zero when it's not being governed by the optic flow map and this will stop it just drifting continuously in one direction. And finally, when the ball does reach the edge of the screen, I'm going to wrap it around to the other side. This means we've got nothing left to do other than draw the screen. And we'll use the uh, realistic camera image, not the filtered one, because that's what the user might expect to see. And I'm going to draw the ball. Of course, it's not really a ball, it's a rectangle. I'm going to use the fill command provided by the game engine to do such. Let's take a look. And so here we can see the red rectangle in the middle of the screen and I can push it up there and I'll try and grab hold of it and bring it back down and if I try, I've got to get my hands in the right order, push it over towards my other hand and bring it back and push it again. And you can see I've actually got quite reasonably accurate control over it. I might not have reasonably accurate control over my own arms but at least I can move the rectangle around some way on the screen. Let's try and bring you back down here. Now, it's quite interesting this because it's got stuck on the corner of the screen and we'll discuss that in a minute once I've finished playing with this because it's actually quite addictive to do. Here's my other hand, move that in. And if I try and thump it, the higher velocity sends it on its way, you see? So why was it clinging to the edge of the screen? Well, in the comparison phase of the algorithm where we're comparing patches, we call this get pixel lambda function. And for pixels close to the edge of the array, these values will lie beyond the edges of the array. And we've told our lambda function to return zero in this case. So we get an unfair comparison. And we'll be looking at handling this edge effect and introducing some serious optimization through the use of integral images in the follow-up video in this series. If you've enjoyed this video, give me a big thumbs up. I know it's been a bit more technical than some of my other videos, but I think it's an interesting topic nonetheless. Have a think about subscribing. I see the numbers are still increasing, so I'm really pleased for that. Thank you to all of the new subscribers. And I'll see you next time. Take care.